To discredit and demolish Christendom, the Enlightenment wanted new stories to explain life in ways that contradicted what the Bible taught. And Darwin, Huxley, Hackle, and Charles Lyell provided stories for life's diversity in 1859 and human origins in 1863 and 1871. While it should have been the first topic addressed, the origin of life story came last, with speculations offered between 1868 and 1875. The Bible teaches biogenesis, that life comes from a prior living source, and that life on earth came from the living creator. To contradict biogenesis and eliminate God, a new story was needed for life's origin without a living source, or a biogenesis. As far back as the early 1800s, some imagined electricity might animate dead matter, and experiments were performed in which electrical shocks were applied to dead animals in hopes of reanimating them. The experiments of Carl August Weinhold and Giovanni Aldini, plus her husband's enthusiasm for the idea, inspired Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein, published in 1818, about a doctor who assembled a body with parts from various corpses, charged it with electricity, and it came to life. The botanist Joseph Hooker asked Charles Darwin about life's origin, and we have his response in a letter dated February 1st, 1871. My dear Hooker, it is often said that all the conditions for the first production of a living organism are now present, which could ever have been present. But if, and oh what a big if, we could conceive, in some warm little pond, with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity etc., present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes, at the present day such matter would be instantly devoured, or absorbed, which would not have been the case, before living creatures were formed. In the intro video, we noted that ancient Greek secularists avoided the origin of life problem by assuming that matter was already alive. However, Darwin and his crew would speculate that to make the jump from non-life to life, the earliest life form must have been very simple. Just a fortunate accidental mixture of chemicals or protoplasm within a simple membrane. Enlightenment philosophy assumes that physical matter is the extent of reality, and natural processes alone shape matter with an inherent tendency to organize it into ever higher levels of order over time. So the philosophy dictates that some natural process must have caused inanimate matter to be transformed into very simple protozoa, literally first life. The philosophical speculation was easy because all that is required is imagination. Experiments with electricity had failed to reanimate dead animal carcasses, but there was something else going on that temporarily offered a possible explanation. Around the time that Darwin published The Origin of Species, attempts were being made to lay a transatlantic telegraph cable. However, the cables were not holding up very well, as the ocean bottom seemed to be a very harsh environment. So research efforts were directed at better understanding the ocean floor. Deep sea sediments were sent to T.H. Huxley, who found microscopic, distinctively round platelets that dissolved in acid and were unquestionably inorganic in makeup. He thought he had found the intermediate between matter and life in these monera, and he named them after Ernst Haeckel, Bethibius Hacklei. Well, Haeckel produced pictures of what he imagined these monera looked like, assuming that Huxley's claims of ocean bottom globules becoming animate were true, Ernst Haeckel speculated that life must have developed in a very simple form from a chemical soup on the ocean's floor. Thus, the simplest life had no organs, just a membrane filled with mucus or slime. 
The notion that early life was very simple persisted for the next 50 years. In 1924, the Russian biochemist Alexander Oparin reasserted Hackel's belief that there was very little difference between a living organism and lifeless matter. Thus, life arose from the ongoing process of the evolution of matter. Five years later, in 1929, the British biologist John Haldane published a similar hypothesis, also asserting that the progressive evolution of matter on the primitive Earth had led to the emergence of life. Twenty-four years later, in 1953, Stanley Miller set up an experiment in which a glass tube apparatus was filled with a mixture of gases thought to represent the atmosphere of the early Earth. An electronic charge was passed through it to simulate lightning, and after a short time, a few smudges of several amino acids had formed. This was hailed as proof that the building blocks for life could have formed by simple processes acting on the atmosphere of the early Earth. It has continued to be cited as proof for the evolutionary notion of life's origin. The next year, 1954, Harvard biologist George Wald wrote an important article entitled The Origin of Life. He argued that the spontaneous generation of life from non-living matter will almost certainly happen if given enough time. Time is the hero of the plot, transforming the impossible into possible probable, and then virtually certain. All you have to do is wait, and time will perform the miracles. Forty years later, 1995, in a Smithsonian article, James Treffel asserted that time was the origin of life miracle worker, and that life arose by chance because even unlikely events can happen if you wait long enough. From Darwin's initial speculation in 1871 onward, the idea that life arose from inanimate matter, some kind of prebiotic soup, by natural processes alone, operating over deep time, has been promoted like it was settled scientific fact. Some have even claimed to already have the process pretty well worked out. My 1965 college biology textbook asserted that the origin of life was a matter of physical and chemical events only, that it could be accounted for in purely mechanistic terms, entirely based in physical and chemical properties of the ancient earth. The supernatural was not involved. Only time and natural physical laws. My physical anthropology textbook asserted that life might be a product of inanimate matter, and this was the scientific explanation. Tim Barra begged the question and portrayed his philosophical belief to be an already established fact, since life evolved from non-living matter. In 1995, James Treffel asserted that it was an inescapable conclusion that life was produced from non-life. In 2003, Franklin Harold asserted that life arose here on Earth from inanimate matter by some kind of evolutionary process. In 2004, Harvard biologist Andrew Noel asserted that the recipe for life is not that complicated. And in 2013, it was confidently asserted that before life, there was primordial soup. When evidence does not point towards the desired explanation, those with a predetermined agenda can shift to ideological science, as George Wall demonstrated. You lay out your imagined philosophical scenario and suggest that the impossible might be possible. It could be. After the possible has been around a while, next assert that your wishful thinking is probable. It should be. Finally, move the probable to certainty by asserting it is. Call in the miracle worker, Father Time, to bless your agenda, and if you have influence, you can publish it in respected journals, and it will soon become scientific orthodoxy 
and others will follow along. From Darwin's warm little pond comment in 1871 onward, the notion of life arising from inanimate matter by natural processes alone has had one major weakness. There is no credible evidence to support the idea. Secularists may confidently promote the notion, but they do so on the basis of their philosophical commitments, not evidence. I previously noted that my 1965 college biology textbook confidently asserted that life was the result of physical and chemical events only, and that science could account for living properties in purely mechanistic terms. Really? Then why didn't the textbook contain the formula, or at least a simplified summary of the process? And if it's just simple physics, chemistry, and they have it all figured out, then why did we not attempt to cook up some protozoa in our lab sessions? That would have been fun. Well, the answer is simple. To this day, nobody knows the formula, nor has anyone done that under laboratory conditions. Those confidently promoting this notion are spouting philosophy, not science. T.H. Huxley was eager to believe that the round platelets he found in samples sent to him were the intermediate step between non-life and life. However, within a few years, the wheels came off of the Monera story, and it was quietly retired. In 1872, the year after Darwin's warm little pond comment, the British zoologist Sir Charles Wyville Thompson led a three-and-a-half-year-long deep-sea exploration aboard the corvette HMS Challenger. Thompson and the other scientists aboard found the deep-sea slime teeming with life but no sign of the Bathybius platelets. A chemist on board the Challenger ultimately determined that these did not occur on the ocean floor, but were a precipitate of calcium sulfate that had been produced when alcohol had been added to the deep sea samples as a preservative. Although the 1953 Miller-Urey experiment did produce a few smudges of amino acids, keep in mind that a number of amino acids have to be lined up and bonded together in a very particular way to become a protein. And those who have been involved in the research tell us those amino acids are not primed to link up on their own, but require some heavy-duty manipulation to make it happen. After you have proteins, they then have to be organized in a very particular way by complex coded information, DNA, to become a living cell. To equate a few disconnected amino acids with a living cell is like equating a handful of nails with a finished house ready to move into. It was also later determined that the mixture of gases Miller used probably did not represent the early Earth's atmosphere. The Miller-Urey experiment was intelligently designed and manipulated in a laboratory to produce a few basic chemical building blocks. But when more likely mixtures of gases were tried, nothing happened. Earlier, we noted George Wall's confident assertion that the spontaneous generation of life from non-life was inevitable if one just had enough miracle working time. However, in that same article, he admitted that Pasteur had scientifically demolished the idea of the spontaneous generation of life from non-life, leaving special creation as the only remaining option. Anyone contemplating the magnitude of the task would have to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism was impossible. However, to avoid the God answer, he was going to believe in spontaneous generation anyway. I earlier cited Franklin Harrell's confident assertion that life arose from inanimate matter by some kind of evolutionary process. But he went on to say that this was not a demonstrable fact, but an assumption that is not supported by any direct evidence, and probably never would be. Some kind of evolutionary process? And it's just an assumption without any evidence? How did this kind of malarkey ever become associated with the respected name of science? 
The men of the Enlightenment were obsessed with discrediting biblical supernaturalism and embraced an opposite philosophy and the stories that would flow from it, blindly confident that evidence yet to be found would support their agenda. But the evidence has not accumulated, as expected. So on one hand, you have loyal believers within college faculty ranks staunchly passing on the stories they were taught to gullible college students who had better believe them also if they want to receive advanced degrees and a faculty position in academia. On the other hand, you have a few big names at the top of the ladder who occasionally have flashes of conscience and express with a sense of desperation what they know to be true, like John Horgan did in a 2011 article in the Scientific American, admitting that after 140 years, scientists still have no clue as to how life could have arisen from non-life by naturalistic processes. To discredit biblical supernaturalism and move Western civilization towards enlightened secularism, the men of the Enlightenment equated science with materialistic naturalism. So to explain life's origin, their philosophy dictated two foundational assumptions. First, they dogmatically rejected the possibility that God exists and could have created life, which left them with only one possible explanation. Life must have arisen from inanimate matter by simple unguided chemical processes alone. They had no evidence for life arising from inanimate matter by natural processes alone, but their philosophy demanded it, and they quickly embraced it as fact. Second, the naturalistic life from non-life scenario requires that early single-cell life must have been very simple. Biochemist Michael Behe notes that the key to selling this notion was to portray the cell as simple. However, as it turns out, single-cell life is not simple at all. The same year as the Miller-Urey experiment, 1953, the first inklings of this fact began to surface, as Crick and Watson discovered that cellular processes were driven by a complex code recorded in the double helix structure of DNA. Further research has demonstrated that cells are extremely complex micro-machinery full of information. The expectation that the basis of life would be simple has been smashed. The complexity of biological systems has paralyzed science's attempt to explain their origins. Beyond empty assertions, the professional scientific literature lacks any support for it. The structure of the systems themselves offer compelling reasons why a Darwinian explanation will continue to be elusive. Concerning DNA, Bill Gates has said that human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. And systems biologist Stephen Larson describes what science now understands about what goes on within a living cell. And yet, when I look through a microscope at a humble bacterium, I still wonder how it really works. <laughs> because the mechanical watch that is life is not like any watch we've ever built. It is biological gears and springs, but they fill you know, rooms and buildings and cities of a vast microscopic landscape that's bustling with activity. I mean, on the one hand, it's extremely well organized. But on the other hand, the sheer scale of all of this unfamiliar, well-organized stuff that happens in there makes me feel like you know, I've stumbled onto an alternate landscape of technology that's built by an engineer a million times smarter than me. Having rejected the possibility of an intelligent designer because of philosophical commitments, Secularists are faced with and admit that the natural order gives the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Biology is the study of complicated things that appear to have been designed for a purpose. Plants and animals seem intricately and almost perfectly designed for living their lives. 
the more one learns about plants and animals, you marvel at how well their designs fit their ways of life. The design inference comes naturally. People think that a designer created the world, because it looks designed. The appearance of design is obvious, but the materialistic philosophy of those now controlling science forbids the logical conclusion of a designer. Thus, knowing that design suggests a designer, in 1988, Francis Crick warned biologists to not consider that possibility, but to keep telling themselves that biological processes were not designed, but evolved. And we earlier noted Richard Lewontin's admission in 1997 that science is now built on a commitment to materialism so absolute that they cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now, at this point, an open-minded person should be thinking about human experience and what the experts have admitted. Our universal experience is that life comes from a prior living source, while the spontaneous generation of life from inanimate matter has been scientifically disproven and admitted to be impossible. After 150 years, nobody has observed life arising from inanimate matter by natural processes alone, Nobody has demonstrated such a process under laboratory conditions, and nobody knows the formula. Cells are not simple, but their operations are driven by a very complex system of coded information that resembles, but is far beyond, humanly produced computer software. Living cells appear to have been designed for a purpose by an engineer a million times smarter than a brilliant expert trained in computers and neuroscience. There are good reasons why intelligent design is, if not the best explanation for life's origin, it is at least a very reasonable and likely explanation. If science still followed the evidence to the best explanation, this would be a live option. But because science is now dominated by people with a philosophical commitment to atheistic materialism, that option is strictly forbidden. Have you ever walked into a restaurant expecting something that they've been advertising? but we're told that they don't have any of it? Well, don't get your taste buds salivating for some primordial soup, because it seems that this dish exists only in the imagination of wishful thinkers desperately trying to avoid the God answer. In 1977, Hubert Yockey said that Darwin's warm little pond scenario was invented, without evidence, as a materialistic explanation for the origin of life. It continues to be unsupported by any valid evidence and is embraced by faith rather than fact. In 1983, Fred Hoyle said plainly that there is not a shred of evidence for the notion that life began in an organic soup. In 1986, biochemist Michael Denton noted that while portrayed as an established reality, there is no positive evidence for the existence of prebiotic soup. The Miller-Urey experiment continues to be mentioned in textbooks, but unresolved issues and serious questions about nearly every aspect of it are ignored. In 1999, Noam Lahav reminded us that under more likely conditions, the Miller-Urey process does not produce amino acids. There are good reasons for doubting prebiotic soup, for there is no published evidence for its existence. And even if there was, the concentration of organic building blocks would have been too small to be effective. You may remember in the video on life's diversity, we noted the desperate attempt to account for information by the infinite monkey theorem. If enough monkeys type long enough, mere chance suggests that they could eventually type out Shakespeare's works. 
However, neither the statistics nor experimental evidence for that were encouraging, and the same weakness applies to materials necessary for life's origin. Those trying to explain how life arose accidentally without a designer, and then they themselves play the designer's role, are missing the point. You see this when highly educated people create complex experiments in a laboratory, constructing and manipulating environments and events in a glass tube apparatus, or designing a computer program to give them the results that they intelligently designed into their experiment. And if primordial soup is such a solid explanation, then why are there so many alternative suggestions? If the warm little pond primordial soup notion was really based on any credible evidence, then everybody, or at least most, would be riding on that wagon. Instead, since 1953, a wide range of unrelated alternatives have been suggested. This really looks like an imagination free-for-all, and every suggestion that follows has been collected from published sources. If life did not arise in ocean floor Monera, or in a warm little pond or primordial soup, then, maybe life began in chemically rich hot undersea vents. Or maybe on the backs of crystals. Perhaps in clay. Maybe life began between sheets of mica. Or in arsenic. Maybe the materials came from a collision with a comet. Or blasted in on a meteorite. Or from a planetary collision. Or a solar super flare. Maybe on exoplanets. Maybe deep space sugars. Maybe in ghost dunes underneath Mars surface. Maybe in the salty oceans discovered on the moons of Jupiter, or maybe in the methane and ethane lakes of Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Maybe on a super Earth 30 trillion miles away. Maybe it arose from, or produces, poisonous space gas. Finally, some including Richard Dawkins have suggested that life on Earth may have been designed and planted here by an alien civilization elsewhere. In other words, they're okay with almost any possibility, even intelligent designers from another planet, as long as the designer isn't God. Imagining panspermia just pushes the problem into outer space. If life did not begin on Earth by a naturalistic process, where we know it at least exists, how did it begin in outer space? And why should anyone seriously consider that when there is no evidence for it? All of these widely differing suggestions for life's origin tells me two things. First, there are a bunch of folks who do not have a serious clue as to what natural processes or conditions actually produce the first life. They are all groping. Second, like George Wald, they are so desperate to avoid the forbidden God answer that they are willing to imagine almost any naturalistic explanation no matter how far-fetched. When the public hears this imaginative variety of guesses about life's origin coming from those who claim to be scientists, there are reasons for concern about the nature of modern science. On the other hand, there is a much larger group of good scientists not interested in sensational headlines or promoting philosophical ideology who have been courageous enough to be honest about the lack of serious evidence for a naturalistic origin of life story. The macromolecule to cell transition is a huge jump. It is not a testable hypothesis. All is conjecture, not enough facts to postulate an explanation, and there is no scientific evidence for it. The origin of life problem is much more difficult than most envisioned. Nobody knows where the seeds of life came from. Nobody knows how life originated on this planet. We remain in substantial ignorance. Scientists do not know if life is an inevitable consequence of planetary formation. And, they do not know how life started on Earth. They don't know when, or under what circumstances. The origin of life is one of the big questions in science. Many believe life arose from a prebiotic soup, but how? They have no idea. Scientists do not understand 
how primordial ooze shifted, from simple chemistry, to complex self-replication. The origin of life is the most fundamental, and least understood biological problem. Scientists don't know how biomolecules got together to start life. Geologists, chemists, astronomers and biologists are as stumped as ever, by the riddle of life. The origin of life on Earth is important, but it is an elusive problem, frustrated by the lack of evidence. There is no good scientific reason to believe that life ever generated out of inanimate matter by natural processes alone. Except for its place in some overactive imaginations, there is no good reason to believe that the primordial soup kitchen was ever really open for business. Secularists portray the continuing controversy over evolution and intelligent design or creationism as caused by ignorant religious people who do not understand, hate science, and refuse to give up ancient Middle Eastern mythology. However, Christians were the driving force behind the development of modern empirical and inductive science prior to the Enlightenment and still highly value observation and evidence-based science. I would suggest that the ridicule critics as ignorant tactic is an arrogant elitist version of head in the sand. There are substantial reasons for doubting Darwinism. In these videos I have presented what I see as major flaws in Darwin's story for life's diversity. Mendel's genetics revealed limits on variation so that Darwin was wrong about unlimited minor variation accumulating to produce transformation, slowly changing protozoa into people and everything in between. Darwin got his story off the ground with a change mechanism that was later found to not work, Lamarck's notion of inherited adaptation. It was replaced in the 1930s and 40s by random genetic mutation, which every biology student learns are rare, and when they do happen, they are either neutral or harmful, rendering the life form less fit, unable to reproduce, or dead. Finally, Darwin was aware and concerned, and it was reiterated by experts in the 1920s, 1950s, 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s that fossils do not look like Darwin's story happened. The expected transitional intermediate fossils are extremely rare or systematically missing because it looks like all of the major groups of life forms appeared at about the same time. The story of humans evolving from a common ancestor shared with the great apes has also suffered from meager and confusing evidence from the beginning. The American Museum of Natural History was just being honest in 2021 when it admitted that the narrative on human origins is just a big mess with no consensus. As for the naturalistic story for life's origin from non-life, evidence is lacking and nobody actually has a clue how it could have happened. Now you can ridicule biblical supernaturalism if you want. But the concepts in Genesis increasingly look to me like a simple but accurate summary of what accumulating evidence was suggesting. The controversy will not go away because the evidence problems for Darwinian stories are real. <laughs>